Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Hi, this is James Kandasamy. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I appreciate you. I know I provide a lot of value through this podcast and I want you to share it with your friends, with your families and anybody else that you know that kind of benefit from listening to this kind of content. Go share it through Facebook, into LinkedIn, to Twitter, to Instagram or any other channels that you want to share it because sharing is caring. Thank you. Let's go on with the show. Hi, webinar attendees. This is James Kandasamy from Achieve Investment Group. Today, we have a Casey Conway, who's going to be talking about commercial real estate outlook. This is going to be a webinar, and also we're going to do a, a podcast format as well. If you have any questions, please make sure that you put in into the Q&A section of the Zoom tool over here. So let me get started. I just want to quickly introduce myself and after that, go to the next stage of uh, Casey's presentation. So we are Achieve Investment Group. We are a vertically integrated team in San Antonio and Austin, and we are focusing a lot on buying apartments, which is primarily class B and C. I focus a lot on acquisition and investor relationship, and my wife here, Shanti James, focuses a lot on the property and construction management. We have more than $130 million in asset under management, 1,700 units, nine apartments. Uh, I'm also the author of best-selling book, Passive Investing in Commercial Real Estate, which has sold more than 2,000 copies after launching in the past 12 months, uh, was mentioned top 15 real estate investing book by Jim Kramer's The Street. And uh, I didn't pay for pay for that. It, it, it just came out randomly. So that's a good uh, review that given to me by, you know, by one of the established and, and famous channel like The Street, right? So uh, I also have my own podcast. It's called Achieve Wealth Through Value at Real Estate Investing Podcast. And we have multifamily investors group in Facebook, which has almost uh, 5,500 members in the past uh, 14 months. And if you want to connect with us, just text ACHIEVE to 38470 to connect with us. And you know, you'll be able to come into our newsletter investors and distribution list. All right, Casey, I'm going to pass this to, to you. All right. So, uh, so James, that's a pretty good endorsement. You get a shout out from uh, James Kramer. I love him. I wa- watch him a lot. So that's, that's, uh, that's high praise. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're a surprise, so it, but that's good. Yeah. And so your wife, if she's dealing with the construction management issue, she's doing the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> Property management and construction. Yeah. You know, I'm doing the easy one. Yeah. She's, she's, she's doing the, uh, the harder part of the work. Yes. Well, that's great. You got a good, got a good team there. So I really am um, pleased to be with here with you tonight. And uh, I'm in, I'm in Atlanta. Some of those who may have been listening early on, it's I think 96 and, and about 90% humidity today here. So it is, it is a miserable. We have the, mis- if they have a misery index. It's just miserable. <laughs> I grew up in Colorado. We didn't have a miserable day in the summer. It was always nice. So uh, I love your, uh, love your Austin, San Antonio marks. I love San Antonio. I did a logistics uh, presentation webinar earlier this week and I talked about the port of San Antonio and people did not have a clue what I was talking about. And I, when I, when I educated him on the port of San Antonio, and it's really the kind of the cybersecurity uh, epicenter for all of our ports and logistics. Uh, they dialed in a little bit. So I educated a few on the port of San Antonio this week. <laughs> hmm. Okay. That's so anyway, so my background, I grew up in Colorado, uh, been in Atlanta about 40 years, uh, came down here to go to business school at Emory university Started out on the appraisal track at my MAI and realized um, nobody believed the number in an appraisal, <laughs> but I but I knew how to manipulate cash flows and value. So I was off to the races to do CRE finance. <laughs> so I, I worked. And and yeah. just a reminder to the listeners and audience, you know, if you have any questions, please use the Q and A box down there to answer, and we will answer questions as we move through the slides, and we'll answer at the end as well. So. So I've I've done a different things. I've been appraisal. I've done uh, asset management. Worked for equitable real estate, the old equitable and prudential, and um, done done banking. Uh, was in the Fed two thousand five to ten, the last real nightmare. Um, I was at the New York Fed two thousand nine and ten. I am so glad I'm not in the Federal Reserve this time around. It was terrible then. I can't imagine what it is right now. But I, I did. I briefed Chairman 
Bernanke and helped be involved in a lot of the policy that was eventually developed, like TARP and TALF and what to do with AIG. So I'll give you some interesting perspectives. So the last three years, I uh, have kind of had a number of hats I wear. I joined the University of Alabama and their commercial real estate center with a really cool name, ACRE, a unit of land measurement, uh, Alabama Center for Real Estate. I'm also the CCIM's chief economist. I value that relationship tremendously. I think the CCIM Institute really is crushing it in terms of education and, and really bringing education and the relationship side to it. And then I also sit on the board of directors. I'm an independent director for a public REIT in uh, the New York region. It's called Monmouth. And we are, all we do is logistics and big warehouses. Our primary tenant in over half our buildings is a little company known as FedEx. So I really get to practice um, logistics every <laughs> every month and what we're doing. So um, it's not just theory to me, it's, it's real life. And then I do a lot of expert witness work, um, particularly in property tax appeals. So a lot of big retail companies and, and whatnot. So that's what I do to keep busy. I have kids five or ten to ten to twenty five. So uh, only my only my young son is happy that I'm home. My daughters and my wife think I ask too many questions and have become too aware of what's going on in the in the family world. So they want me to get back on the road. So that's my background. I'll advance here. On to the uh, second slide is just my disclaimer. This is to protect you, uh, James, and your wife, Shanti. So these are all my crazy thoughts and ideas. And uh, so if I say something offensive, uh, I'll, uh, we'll figure out how to do the uh, virtual version of my, uh, of my square and give you my $100 net worth that I have after the kids, <laughs> after the kids have raided all, all the checking and, and oh. savings accounts. So there's your protection there. Thank you. Uh, a lot of content, I produce a lot each week. If we're, any of your audience members are not connected with me on LinkedIn, please send me an invite and I'll accept it. Um, but a lot of this stuff I produce is on our university website. So here's the link to it. I do a weekly insight on Wednesday of each week. Um, these are pretty in-depth things, two to 3,000 words on something very topical. Um, I'll never tell you what I'm barbecuing or who's coming over to the house or the pool. Uh, it's all pretty good, serious stuff. So here, here's the link in the weekly insight. The one I posted here on the right is the one I call the other L&T industry, leisure and travel instead of logistics and transportation. Because um, you'll you'll see it's the one I'm the most concerned about of all the property types, and I think you're going to do just fine in multifamily. So that that's a prelude to the conclusion. It'll be okay. <laughs> you'll be fine. I always have a reading recommendation. So the dean gets mad if I don't give a reading recommendation. Anything I do, so I always have something fun. So I have to I have to get um, permission to get a your book and and cover it, read it and get a cover on here. Um, but this one's called Whatever Happened to Penny Candy. It's a great, short, uh, logical, late person explanation of economics. And I think we all need to get tuned up on economics because every metric that we thought we knew or we relied on has been turned upside down. And there are going to be many new metrics that tell us where we're headed. My favorite chapter in the book is chapter two. It's titled with the acronym Tan Staffel. That stands for there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. I sent 100 copies to the bank regulators, the Fed and FDIC and OCC this week when I did my quarterly briefing on CRE conditions because uh, I think the Fed needs to know there ain't no such thing as a free lunch with all of the expansion of their balance sheet they're doing. Remember, the Fed doesn't produce or sell anything. They just call Treasury and say, please print money. So we are greatly um, devaluing the dollar, expanding the money supply, and there will be a day of reckoning for that. So here's your light reading that won't won't make you stay up all night with nightmares. All right. The big question we all want answered is it was, you know, when we in May, it was, are we there yet? Because we were opening up the states and I've changed it to when will we be there? Because we're nowhere close to being there. I'm 58. I grew up in an era when families would go on vacation. We, we piled all the kids into what was the precursor to the minivan that was a a family station wagon with phony wood paneling. <laughs> and as us kids were never told where we were going or how long it was going to take, we would bug mom and dad by asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> so I thought that'd be a, a good analogy here. So back in the early part of June, over a month ago, we knew we weren't there when the Dow had its biggest drop of 1,800 points to over 7%. Then less than a week later, we got that great retail sales report where it went up an all-time record in one month, 17% in May. Um, June was up another 7%. Uh, but now we're dealing with the reality that the state reopening is not probably gone as well as we had hoped. 
We've got COVID completely out of control in this country. We're setting new daily record counts. You guys know about it in Texas. I spoke with a group in Houston, uh, the Fort Bend Economic Development Council, I think the end of last week, and, and we talked about what's going on in Houston. And then we got the jobless claims uh, today, and they reversed course. We were at least heading down, still well above a million, but they went up from a million three to a million four today. So when we look at what's happening in terms of company layoffs and whatnot, ignore the jobs report, look at the forward indicators like job cuts and jobless claims, and they're not telling us that we're anywhere close to being there yet. So let's start with the COVID cases. The website I'd recommend you all follow is the John Hopkins University. It has no politics in it. They really collect the data, visualize it, graph it, so you can see. Um, I pulled these, I think, this morning. Um, James, we were over 15 million cases globally. To put that in perspective, the 1st of April, we only had 900,000 cases globally. So this is a 15 times increase in about four months. Um, we have more cases than anybody in the world. We have 25% of the world's cases. I um, believe we did top 4 million cases today. We're adding about 70,000 a day. And the reason I bring this up is because the COVID cases really are connected to the economic reopening bone, which is connected to the stressed commercial real estate bone. So if you look at the state rankings... Um, Casey, I just want to uh, quickly inject a yeah. question because I know this is in everybody's mind. Do you think it's because of testing? Well, it's part. We are, we are testing more people, but when you look at um, the, the density ratio in terms of the testing, it's clear we, we have more that actually have the cases. It's not just the testing count, but it is the actual density. The mortality rate is not bad. It's a whole lot worse than we thought. When we first started this thing out, we thought it was 3 or 4%. I think the latest numbers I saw were it's it's, it's below half of one percent. So maybe it's uh you know maybe we've killed off all the weak, <laughs> and it's just the strong youth that are left and they're not dying. Um, but testing is a part of it. But it, it's more than that. We we really the virus didn't abate. We don't have a vaccine. We're better at treating the disease. So not as many are having as severe conditions. We catch it earlier. The testing allows us to catch it earlier so we can intervene with treatment and we don't have as much mortality. So, But we still don't have it under control. When the CDC, after the 4th of July, said, look, it, shelter in place is a genie that we can't put back in the bottle. This The virus is out of control. And until we get a virus, um, we're really not going to get this under control or we're just going to have to go for herd immunity, which is put the 20% that are vulnerable away and let the 80% get it. And I think they took that to heart in Alabama. I, I have not been back over in a few months, but um, I, my, my daughter was telling me that they were having COVID-19 parties at the University of Alabama and in, in some of the kids that were on campus for the summer. And uh, whoever got it first uh, won the pot of money. It's absolutely crazy stuff. But anyway, yeah. good question. I think it's important to look at the state rankings. California just surpassed New York with the most number of cases. So when you look at the significance of the California economy and its importance in logistics and the ports of LA and Long Beach, uh, the importance of wine from the Napa Valley, it's, it's going to be a big deal. The states that are now in the top 10 or 15 weren't even in the top 20 a month ago. Florida, Texas, Georgia, Arizona, North Carolina, they have all risen very, very rapidly. So the, the reason I point this out is this is really going to affect reopening the economy, what plays out in this new stimulus bill if Congress can get their act together before August 7th and actually pass something. So it'll really direct a lot of what we've got there. But we do not have it under control. And so I start there until we see it under control, until we have a vaccine, until we really bend this group. We want to look like Hawaii over there on the left. And you look at the states that have the lowest counts. If you want to go on vacation this summer, go to Montana, Wyoming, Alaska, Hawaii, or Vermont. It's, it's safe. Nobody will give you COVID there. But you'll probably give it to them. <laughs> so they're probably unhappy I just said that. All right. Next slide, I want to talk about the jobs reports because we had what I call the Humpty Dumpty jobs report in April. It was the worst ever. 20 million people reported unemployed, lost their jobs. And then May, it came charging back. In June, we were up 4.8 million jobs. What in the world? If you look at the charts over there on the right between employment and unemployment, job loss, these charts just are anomalies. It's a true definition of what a tail looks like in terms of tail risk. Here's what you need to know about the jobs numbers. The first is in March with the CARES bill, we did something we never did in employment and unemployment. We allowed 1099 workers and um, 
sole proprietors to apply for unemployment and be counted. And so that's why the number went up so much in April. We added 20, 30 million people that we had never counted. Well, then in May, when they went to apply to continue their benefits in June, they weren't able, those 1099 workers and sole proprietors were busy trying to keep their little business going or finding another contractor job that they didn't fill out their worksheets showing they were actively uh, interviewing for jobs in May. So the BLS said, up, oh, you're out of here. You're not in the workforce. You didn't do your job. You didn't look for a job. So they removed 9 million people in May and about the same number in June. And so they don't know what they're counting. And the in the CARES bill, what it did is it's caused such distortion that these government job numbers really make no sense at all. So Hopefully that gives a little bit of perspective. So what do I look at for job numbers? So I look at things like job cuts and some of the headlines. So I look at the on the right there, the Challenger Gray job cuts number. Every month they produce this. They've told us that we've cut a million four people. These have not been encountered in the BLS numbers because they're still receiving some sort of benefit or haven't actually been cut. So they can't apply for unemployment. And if we look on the left side there, we can see companies, whether it's United Airlines or Delta or Southwest, they're all sending out what are called warn notices. And these are required as part of the CARES bill that companies like airlines that got financial support committed to keeping their employees on through September, they have to give them 60 days notice if they don't plan to keep them on beyond September. So they're starting to give employees those numbers. They're asking for voluntary separations. And if CARES bill isn't extended or Congress works something out, you are going to see more bankruptcies and more job cuts than we've ever seen in this country's history. Um, all of the airlines will file, probably file bankruptcy in October. Um, they're not going to take another government bailout. They're not going to surrender ownership of the company. They're not going to allow the government to be on boards of directors like um, Lufthansa did to the German government. Uh, they're going to use bankruptcy to discharge contracts, plane orders, gate contracts, labor contracts, and more importantly, route structures, contracts where they got to still fly. So already Southwest CEO was on today at Alaska Air. Alaska Air has already cut over half of its route structure. So if you're a secondary city, you really need to be concerned about this because now instead of having daily flights, you only have maybe two or three times a week or once a week. This could have real economic um, impacts to you.